They should be bending over backwards to help us. It does not make any sense, and it makes the American people think the White House has something to hide. There's obviously a paper trail, ladies and gentlemen. There is a paper trail that the White House does not want our committee to follow. But let it be known that we will follow it. We will follow it with everything we've got. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal. Thank you to uh, Representative Cummings for his uh, really profoundly significant historic work and to all of our colleagues for being here today. I think that the swamp image lends itself to mimicry and mockery, and I love the reptiles. Uh, I love the swamp thing truck. Uh, I'm going to use them when I go home this weekend uh, without attribution. <laughs> uh, and by the way, Sheldon, uh, daughters love trucks, too, I can tell you, with three, three sons and a daughter. Um, but uh, despite the humor, uh, this subject is really deadly serious because it is a matter of national interest and national security. The evidence that Representative Cummings just outlined is powerful, mounting, incontrovertible incontrovertible evidence that there has been a violation of criminal law. This evidence is powerful in showing that General Flynn broke significant criminal laws, the DIA letter, the DOD letter, the Inspector General letter, all testify to a flagrant violation of federal criminal statutes that must be investigated and prosecuted. And it will not be investigated and prosecuted unless there is a special prosecutor. For all the reasons that Representative Cummings outlined so powerfully about the White House seeking, in effect, to cover up for General Flynn, we can't count on the Attorney General or his deputy who report to the President of the United States and the White House to do that job there needs to be a special prosecutor. And likewise, the conflicts of interest on the part of President Trump and others in the White House require a special prosecutor to investigate and pursue. Just weeks after the election, an investigation by ABC News revealed that the Trump organization was $364 million in debt to Deutsche Bank which at the time was under investigation by the Department of Justice. Its role in the 2008 financial crisis and potential wrongdoing in a multi-billion dollar offshore trading and money laundering scheme involving Russia is directly at issue. A special prosecutor must investigate potential Trump ties to that Russian money laundering. Meanwhile, the President-elect, even before the inaugural, was meeting with Indian real estate executives who had plans to build a Trump-branded complex in Mumbai. Inexplicably, his children, Ivanka and Eric Trump, were in attendance as well. It was reported that his first phone call, very first phone call with the President of Argentina included a discussion of permit issues relating to Trump-branded office buildings in Buenos Aires. One of his first calls after the election was from the Turkish president, during which they discussed, what else? The Trump Organization's business partners in Istanbul. And over the last 100 days since the inaugural, it has only gotten worse. As you all know, the Associated Press reported in March that China has granted preliminary approval for 38 new Trump Organization trademarks, paving the way for Donald Trump and his family to, quote, develop a host of branded businesses from hotels and golf clubs to bodyguard and other services. These are direct benefits to the Trump Organization and to Donald Trump himself, 
that directly implicate the national security of the United States because they potentially compromise our national interests. Whose interest is Donald Trump putting first? His organizations, the Trump brand, the Trump hotels and golf clubs, or our nation's interests? He has done nothing to relieve those conflicts of interest. There is no blind trust. There has been no divestment of property. He continues to benefit directly from the Trump Organization. And just this week, the State Department posted what amounted to an advertisement for Mar-a-Lago on its official website, bragging about the President's <coughs> private for-profit, private for-profit country club, and calling it the Winter White House. The post has been taken down, but the conflicts of interest remain, and the people of the United States deserve a special prosecutor to investigate them. I'm now pleased to turn the podium over to a great champion of working people, Representative Sardanes, and thank you for your work on thank the Democracy you, Project. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'll be brief because I think you're picking up on the, on the theme here. Uh, President Trump said he would drain the swamp in Washington. He's flooded it. He said he would break the cycle of corruption. He used those words. He's accelerated. He said he would end decades of special interest dealing. He's created a new mold on that every day, and he's broken that mold the day after. So we're 100 days into his administration, and the President has reneged on one of the most fundamental promises that he made to Americans across the country, which was that he would come here and that he would clean up Washington, that he would drain the swamp. The Democracy Reform Task Force, which I'm privileged to chair uh, in the House, is releasing a report today, and I want to thank um, our Senate colleagues, uh, Senator Udall, Senator Whitehouse, and, and their colleagues uh, for the Broken Promises report. The Democracy Reform Task Force is releasing Swamped, which is 100 ways in 100 days that the President has flooded the swamp in Washington. And believe me, we had to work hard to just decide which 100 examples of flooding the swamp we would pick because there are, there are so many. But I want to read you, I'm not going to read you the 100 ways, but I'm going to read you the seven or eight categories that we're able to put all these items into because I think it's important for you to hear these and it reinforces some of the, the themes that you've already heard today. Number one, President Trump has made a mockery of ethics laws and regulations. Two, he's promoted a culture of secrecy in the executive branch. And we're beginning to see a kind of developing reflex on the part of the president and his cabinet and his agencies to kind of lock the doors and pull down the shades and operate in secrecy when they should be transparent to the American people. He stacked his cabinet with big money campaign donors. We've referred to that. He's installed a special interest revolving door into the Trump White House, which is spinning every single day. He's put big money ahead of the public interest. He's turned the presidency, as Linda said, into a profit-making enterprise. He's pursuing public policy for his own personal benefit, and he's raiding the Treasury every day to pay for vacations and private business promotion. His sons are traveling around the world at taxpayer expense in terms of the security detail that accompanies them, making new deals on behalf of the Trump business. So these are not the actions, clearly, of a president who's intent on draining the swamp or restoring a voice to the voiceless or giving power back to the powerless, as he said he would do. It doesn't pass the laugh test. And I mean that literally. In the last few days, I've been saying to people, did you know that the president is going to point, as one of his accomplishments in the first 100 days, he's going to point to the fact that he has drained the swamp. And people laugh out loud because it's absurd. It's preposterous to suggest that. But as Senator Blumenthal said, this is very serious. This is a sober matter. It has consequences. These ethical violations, this ethical blindness that the White House has and President Trump has, it's not some kind of harmless sideshow. This is not something that's going to just sort of come out, you know, in the wash over time. This goes fundamentally to the question of the public trust. It raises the issue when the President goes to make decisions is he going to have divided loyalties? He's going to make a decision based on what's in the public interest 
Or is somewhere in his brain something going to operate so that, in fact, he leans towards his personal benefit or the benefit of his business and his brand? And I just want to say, uh, in closing, uh, we wish Republicans were standing with us on this, um, who would be putting our democratic institutions above party, putting our constitutional democracy above party. They should be as concerned about these conflicts of interest, um, these ethical violations, as I think most Americans are across the country. And so to wrap it up, I think when Americans of all political stripes look at this kind of information and digest it, it's fair for them to wonder, it's fair for them to wonder, maybe President Trump isn't really looking out for me and my family. Maybe he's just looking out for himself and his business and his buddies and his brand. And that's not right. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce Senator Tammy Duckworth, our former colleague in the House, an American hero, and bringing heroic attention to these issues of conflict of interest. Thank you. Um, thank you, John, for, for your wonderful remarks. Um, you know, time and again, we've seen this president say one thing, and do something completely different. Despite run, running on the pledge to drain the swamp, President Trump has done anything but. Americans deserve a president whose word they can trust, but the number of broken promises just keep piling up. Since he entered office, President Trump has been slow to fill vital positions in his administration. But when he has chosen nominees, they haven't been the sort of names you'd expect coming from someone who wants to drain the swamp. Many have been either unqualified, incompetent, or extreme. During their confirmation hearings, some of his cabinet secretaries showed they were clearly unprepared to lead the agencies and departments for which they were chosen. Some were patronage hires, which the president railed against during his campaign. In an administration stocked with questionable hires, including Betsy DeVos, the selection of Don Benton to be director of the Selective Service System stands out. For those of you who are, familiar, who are unfamiliar with the Selective Service, it's an agency that's vital to our national security. The director of the Selective Service is charged with registering young men in this country who could be drafted into the armed forces if there ever is an, a national emergency. Of course, we are all strong supporters of an all-volunteer force who are committed to ensuring the military is not forced to resort to involuntary conscription, the draft. But, if a draft were ever reinstated, Mr. Benton would be responsible for making life and death decisions for our children. In the unlikely event we, have ever, we ever have to have another draft, it's critical that we have a capable leader for the agency running it. So, given the importance of this position, it's important to ask, is Don Benton even qualified for this job? Unsurprisingly, from the Trump administration, for the Trump administration, the answer that we must conclude is no. Like the president, who has never worn our nation's uniform and received five draft deferments for a bone spur that he can't even remember which foot it was on, Don Benton never served. In fact, he is the first director in the history of this agency to have never served in the armed forces. He has no experience leading an organization with an annual budget of approximately $25 million. He appears to lack expertise in cybersecurity and securing sensitive information systems, which is a critical responsibility for an agency that maintains a massive database of personally identifiable information, a critical qualification at this time period when we know the Russians are hacking us and want to engage in messing around with our democracy. Mr. Benton has a history of making misogynist and rude comments. That in itself, extremely troubling, but now at a time when our military cannot fulfill its mission without its female warriors, at a time when the House Armed Services Committee voted in a bipartisan way to include women in the Selective Service registration, is especially troubling to have as the head of this agency, someone who has shown that he has sexually harassed women and has made misogynistic, rude comments about women. His only qualification seems to be 
that he was a Trump campaign's Washington state chairman and an early Trump backer. He himself points to the fact that he sat down and had a filet of fish at McDonald's with the president. Now, my daughter, Abigail, that happens to be her favorite meal. But unfortunately, I do not think enjoying a filet of fish with the president is qualifications to become director of the Selective Service. You know, I think this is what that seems to be why he was first rewarded with a job at the EPA. That's where he was intended to go to the EPA until he was removed because he proved to be too extreme, even for EPA administrator Scott Pruitt. Let's let's, let's think about this. This man was supposed to go to the EPA, an agency that the president wants to abolish, an agency that is looking to get rid of three entire Midwest regions three entire regions of the EPA, including the, for the entire Midwest. He was too extreme for that. I'm just going to repeat this. Don Benton was too extreme for Scott Pruitt. So the president decided to put him in charge of deciding which of our children should get sent to war. That's offensive. That is insulting to the men and women who wear the uniform of this country. It is insulting to every parent of a child in this country. Bottom line, our national security is too vital to let this stand. We're talking about positions that make life and death decisions with our children, positions that should not be filled with unqualified political patrons. The American people deserve better than that. And they deserve a president in the White House who actually follows through on his promises. It's now my pleasure to introduce my good friend and fellow classmate in the House, Representative Catherine Clark. Thank you. Good morning. It is a pleasure and honor to be here with my colleagues from the House and with the senators uh, talking about something that is so important to the future of our country and the path that we are going to take. My grandmother always used to say, if you really need to clean something up, sunshine is your best disinfectant. And one of the ways that this administration has continued to not shine a light, not bring things out into the sunshine, is the commitment they have made as of yesterday to never release the president's tax returns. And why is this so important? Why is this so important to our democracy and to the success of our country. It is because within these tax returns lies which team this president is fighting for. Does he have business interests with foreign entities, some of which may not be allies and friends of our country? Does he have loans with foreign banks? How is he, what income is he making? How are the policies that uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin rolled out yesterday going to affect this president? Where is his income coming from? And 74% of Americans still demand, still want to see these tax returns because they want to know whose team is the president on. Is he fighting for American families at home or is he fighting for his billionaire friends? Is he fighting for his brand? Is he fighting for his own ways to line his pockets? Um, Representative Sarbanes said something very important. This should not be a partisan issue. We all should have an interest in continuing, as the presidents of the last 40 years have done, to disclose their tax returns. There is no issue with these being under audit and that standing in the way of them being turned over to the American people. But there is an issue about knowing whose team this president is fighting for. And we join with the American people in saying that it is long past time that the, we see these returns and we know that we are standing with the families at home and fighting for the issues that they talk about around their kitchen tables and need this president to have on the table in the Oval Office. And uh, I will now turn this back um, to Senator Udall for questions. <clears throat> Manu, go ahead. Question for Mr. Cummings. Uh, no. uh, the White House uh, <coughs> said that the documents you were requesting about Michael Flynn, <coughs> they're not in possession of. 
they said that the Defense Intelligence Agency and other agencies have been responsible for terrorism requests. They yeah. say the documents you want after January 20th are just not relevant to an investigation involving Flynn's payments from 2015 and 2016. Why are they relevant to your investigation? They didn't have documents. Remember that? Come on. <clears throat> These guys are playing games. And when you see Mr. Spicer, you can tell him I said that today. Um, they're playing games. Um, they have told us they have the doc. They have documents. And then they said executive privilege. And then they said some of them are before uh, the inauguration. Uh, all I'm saying is we, let me tell you, when H Hillary Clinton, uh, I, I, we were, I was on the Benghazi, ranking on Benghazi and, of course, on uh, oversight. When Hillary Clinton, when they went after her, I mean, if they spent one thousandth of the time going after Trump, President Trump, that they spent with Hillary Clinton, he'd be in big trouble. And I think Sarbanes said it best. This is not about just Democrats, Republicans, or independents. But the Republicans are not helping us. You got to understand that. They are not helping. Um, and they could help. Uh, and so we, again, all of these doc <clears throat> documents are relevant because they go to what his relationship was with the Russians, what his relationship was, was with Turkey. We wanted to see the um, SF-86 uh, forms because we wanted to see exactly what he told the president's people with regard to vetting. Did they vet for the highest security position? I mean, we don't know. But again... There is not one shred of evidence that he, uh, that, that uh, General Flynn got permission to, to receive this foreign money or that he acknowledged receipt of it. Are you satisfied with Chairman Chaffetz's push to get these documents? No, no. I am, I am pleased that he joined me in requesting them. And now the next step is to sit down uh, with the White House and go through some fundamental uh, lessons with regard to separation of powers and the fact that, that uh, we have to keep them in check. And third, try to figure out how we can work out the document situation. If we cannot come to, to uh, a conclusion there and get the documents, then, then there will have to be subpoenas. Keep in mind that when Hillary Clinton was up, was she going through what she was going through, they were subpoenaing, and, and Tammy will tell you, every other day. They are holding emergency hearings. All they got to do is use a little bit of that same effort in this regard. All right? Congressman Cummings, yeah. did Michael Flynn's attorney lie when they put out that statement that said that he had extensively had conversations with the DIA about his payments? He, um, there were, there is no evidence, there's no evidence that and you and you the, the, the documents speak for themselves by the way there's no evidence that there was a permission either either given or even requested or or acknowledged with, with regard to the payments so you can come to your own conclusions but we, we've given you the documents take a look at them all right that's not my decision that's not my decision my decision is to look into this investigate it present it, uh, and let others make the, those, those kind of judgments. But I got to tell you, uh, I go back to what I said uh, before. You, you cannot allow situations where the Congress requests documents and the, basically the White House says, take a hike. That's simply unacceptable. And, and, and it sets a very dangerous precedent. Um, I'm curious if you think your committee should call Flynn to testify before you now. I asked the chairman uh, if he would do that, and he said no. Do you think that he should? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think the American people need to hear uh, from uh, the General Flynn. Keep in mind what his attorney said. He has a story to tell. He said he got a story, and that's what his, his lawyer said. I am interested to know what that story is. And the implication is, is he has a lot of information that will help the American people 
uh, and those looking into this get to the bottom of it. You said that the Republicans are not helping you. You specifically mean Chapitz. Who else do you mean? Who are you directing that to? I, I haven't seen any help. Have you? I haven't seen any from if from if I'm Republicans, period. I mean, there are a few, too, a few, but but I don't see Ryan helping us. Do you? No. You tried to talk to Ryan about No, I, I, I talked to my chairman, Chaffetz. Uh He's the chairman. He said that he's getting his, his orders come from a top, and I don't go above that, all right? Is the, is the and then I've, this is my last question. Is the chairman's medical absence going to slow down this? No, it should not. It should not. It should not. Um, it should not slow it down. Um, I think the American people want answers. Yeah, one of the things that I've emphasized as a ranking member of this committee uh, and, and also the Benghazi committee, uh, select committee, is that the things that we do must have integrity. For the American people to buy into them, they have to have integrity. They have to be fair. They have to be transparent. I mean, when you look at what is happening with Flynn, uh, it's clearly not transparent. Uh, and it would leave a lot of doubts with regard to the American people as to what's going on here. But the, the, the basic question that, that I've been struggling with, and as a lawyer, I, I, I tell you it would, it's something that baffles me, is why in the world, if the president fired someone for lying, do you then seem to protect them? I don't understand that. And, and I think that that leaves a big question mark uh, uh, for 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 all of us, I got to go. Unfortunately, thanks. Bye -bye. Mm -hmm.